It's a Wednesday night, cool outside, and the sun is sinking into the Vancouver skyline. I walk up to the door of the studio, and I grab the handle and pull on the door, and it seems stuck, like maybe it's locked at first. I have the wrong day, I think to myself, and I almost turn around, but the door opens on the fourth yank. I climb up the stairs to the second floor, and the air is thick with heat and incense. In my bones, I can feel a vibrating from the drum beat that is loud. This is a group of people that meets every Wednesday night on Vancouver's east side to move freely in their bodies to music. They're there to remember their bodies in a world that has so often asked them to forget. The first time I'm there, I'm hyper aware of everything. I'm noticing how I'm moving. I'm noticing how other people are moving. I'm wondering what they're thinking about me. I'm spotting a man wearing pants that are both sequins and tie-dye. <laughs> but the third time that I'm there, it was different. Fear wasn't pinning me to the ground anymore. It was in my back pocket as I was swirling around the room. I found myself up against a long wall of mirrors, holding my gaze longer than I'd ever seen myself before. It felt like I was seeing myself with something bigger and deeper than just my eyes. My feet keeping time with the bongos on the other side of the room. It felt like I was being moved. Moved by something, some animal in me, some spirit in me, in a dance together through space. And I held my gaze. I couldn't stop watching myself. I peeled myself off the mirror, captivated by the shapes my hands were making. It felt like I was weaving together threads of heaven and earth. And I looked at my hands, and I had this knowing come over me, the hands of God. My feet in some sort of war dance, I looked down and I saw my feet. Again, the same knowing, the feet. God. I'd heard those words a lot in my church growing up. As a community practicing the ways of Jesus, we were the hands and the feet of God, of love itself. I even heard the metaphor a thousand times, the body of Christ. Somebody, the head, the hands, the feet, all of it good, all of it working together, all of it the way that God comes into the world to help us heal to feel love, to know that we're not alone. So if we're the hands and the feet of God, if we're the body of Christ, then why is it that we so often think of our bodies as bad? Because I'd heard that too. From the same pulpit, from the same scripture, or what I was told about the scripture, I learned that my body was bad. The body, after all, was where sin happened. It was the enemy of the spirit. The body was this reminder that we were never quite with God, but maybe we could hope to be someday. But why did creation out there get to be profoundly telling of the goodness of God, except when creation was my very body? I'd been asking these questions for a long time. I had an eating disorder for about 15 years that on several occasions almost took my life. What we learn in eating disorder treatment is that the eating disorder is a friend and a foe. It's a friend because it comes as a secret companion to help you take away your pain. But it's a foe because over time, the eating disorder takes everything from you. Pretty soon, all of the other parts of you that were there are no longer there. The pain is gone, but so is everything else, too. I found myself in and out of treatment, really just finding ways to get better at hiding the disorder, and then ended up in an outpatient treatment facility on the couch of a therapist who asked me a question that I believe saved my life. She said, do you notice how you're sitting in the chair right now? And in that moment, I remembered I was a body. I didn't remember I had a body. I I had known that. And in fact, I was working very hard to try to kill this body that I had. But when she talked about my body, she told me how I was sitting, changed based on what I was talking about and what the emotion was for me. 
as if the body was telling this story of what it was like to be me. The body was me. As treatment progressed, I had more and more shame about my eating disorder because I kept wondering, am I vain? Am I self-absorbed? Am I lacking faith? People in my faith community had told me, if you really loved God, you couldn't keep doing what you're doing, which is a side note, not something to great, great to say to someone with mental illness. But I found myself asking these questions about the body. It was until, wasn't until I got to graduate school and I started researching our relationships with our bodies and how that's shaped by our sociocultural context that I started to answer that question and realize, no, I wasn't vain. I wasn't self-absorbed. I wasn't lacking faith. I was compliant. I was doing everything I had been instructed to do, that all of us have been instructed to do, which is forget the body. And if we can't do that, we're told, conquer it. Now, you might not have heard it said that explicitly, but you might have heard these words, mind over matter. How did we get here? How did this happen? Here are some ideas that I have about that. Western philosophy and its gravitational pull on widespread religious and political thought gave us a narrative that goes something like this. The spirit and the mind are separate from the body. It's through the mind that we get to truth, but our body just gets in the way of that. Now, it didn't start this way in the early church. In fact, the early church held a more holistic view of the self, influenced by a Hebraic worldview. But over time, contemporary Christian thinking and a misreading of Paul's early letters to the church widened this schism between brain, body, mind, body, spirit, and body. Over time, we saw this influence our social structures. People who weren't able to or weren't allowed to leave their bodies were devalued, used, objectified, and made to disappear. But people who could conquer the body or could leave the body in some way, those people gave themselves social and political power. That was used to create a social hierarchy, which has been used then to justify horrific oppression, like who was made a slave, who was sent to a concentration camp, who was allowed to lead in a political party or a church or a house. But underneath it all, this story, the body is bad and must be controlled. Since we're talking about it, I mean, there are things about the body that are complicated. Our body is where death happens. Our body is what reminds us that we're connected to animals, that we're like animals in some ways. Our body is where we feel pain. Our body allows us to be observed and criticized by other people. And our bodies, they are here, even when we do not want to be here. But the opposite is also true, that our bodies are also the place where life happens. Our bodies are this invitation to remember that we are connected to all life and all living things around us. Our bodies are not only the place where we feel pain, but where we can experience and know joy. Our bodies allow us to be seen and connected to those around us. And lastly, our bodies are here, especially when we want to be here. So in a bold move, I'm going to suggest that maybe Plato wasn't totally right about everything he was saying and present some other ways of thinking about this. They're threefold. First, the body and spirit are not separate from each other. Second, that the body is not bad. The body is so good. And third, this matters for how we connect to everyone around us. Now, if I'm talking about this and you notice feeling uncomfortable or suspicious, I invite you to remember that we exist in a sociocultural context that is built on us forgetting that these things are true. First, body and spirit are not separate from each other. I used to think that the spirit was somewhere far away, somewhere outside of myself. Yes, connecting all of us, but not in me. And it was a few years ago that I learned from my massage therapist, actually while I was on a massage table with my face in the whole thing, of all places, that spirit comes from the Greek word pneuma, 
Pneuma, as it turns out, means breath or breathing or to be breathed. Like that breath that you just took right now. In the Old Testament creation poem, we see God take matter, take dirt, substance, and breathe into it, and it becomes a living being. Not unlike that, the first thing that you did when you were born is you took a breath. The last thing that you do before you die is you'll exhale. Maybe, just maybe, Breath is what makes us different from a cadaver. It's this thing, this animating force that takes us from birth to death, always inviting us into more life. And maybe it's possible that it's because you are a body that you have spirit in you. Maybe spirit is the first thing that happened to you when you were alive. Remember that story of Moses in the Old Testament? Moses meets God in the form of a burning bush, and God says that God's name is I Am. We have that written down in our English translation of the Christian scriptures. The Old and New Testament is Y-H-W-H. But I've learned from some Hebrew scholars and rabbis that it's written in such a way because those letters without vowels in between actually can't be said as a word. They have to be breathed. And it's done this way to remind us that it is God breathing us that every time that we are breathing, we are saying the name of God. So, most of us might have thought that it's our minds that can get us to truth, to God, to spirit, but maybe our bodies know something that our minds have forgotten, which is that the spirit is always here, always with us, in these lungs. Second, the body is not bad, the body is very, very good. Something that might be helpful for you to know about me is that learning about the neurobiology of the traumatic stress response has always done for me what mountains and sunsets and roller coasters have done for other people. It moves me in a way I wish you could know. <laughs> in particular, one of my favorite things to read and think about is something we call polyvagal theory that relates to the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve, if you're not familiar, is this information superhighway that connects our brain to our belly and all of the organs in between that helps us respond to danger. Without any mental effort, our, our vagus nerve coordinates a response to something, a threat, real, perceived, imaginary, remembered, and helps us stay surviving, helps us stay alive as long as possible. Now, what's really cool about the vagus nerve is that it responds in a stepwise fashion to when threat presents itself. First, the vagus nerve mobilizes something we call the social engagement system. That means that our bodies are wired to reach out and connect, to ask for help, to get support, and to say no, to set a boundary. Now, our bodies give us everything that we need to do that, all of the neurotransmitters, all of the energy, even the ability to hear changes in vocal tone, and so much more. But if there's no one there, or if that response doesn't change anything, our vagus nerve mobilizes us into the fight or flight response. This helps us fight or get out of there. But if we can't do that, or we're sufficiently overwhelmed, our vagus nerve actually triggers something called the shutdown response. That's like our bodies being limp like prey in the jaws of a predator, because our system, having evolved the way it has to help us survive, knows that sometimes fighting back creates more danger. Again, none of this is conscious. All of it is our body, this intelligence in our system, helping us do whatever we need based on the specific situation to keep us safe. Interestingly, it's the vagus nerve that allows our lungs to know how to breathe. So for people who've been through trauma, the body is a very, very unsafe place to be. The body can be the place where the experience of the trauma happened and where the memory of the trauma is stored. But when a scary and overwhelming thing happens to us and we're confused by our reaction, sometimes we can end up blaming our bodies for how we're reacting instead of blaming the awful thing that happened. In our culture that is bent on us using bodies to carry our brains around, sometimes we can miss the hidden wisdom written into our DNA. 
Now, lastly, this matters for how we connect to everyone around us. I'll try and hit that in the three points. Emotion, empathy, and justice. Because connection is something we feel and experience, I'm going to start with emotion. Unlike the names that we normally give our emotions, emotions are actually a physiological process, our body giving us what we need to respond to the environment around us, telling us what it's like for us to be in something. So we'll try an experiment together. I want you to think about a time when you felt angry. You might remember feeling hot hands and this rush of energy in your body. What about a time you felt afraid? You might have felt your heart racing and cold hands and joy. My guess is that there was a sense of explosion of energy in your chest with your hands raised to give fist pumps or high fives. Emotion is in our body. It's our body's response. It helps us move towards or away from things that feel good or not so good and gives us the energy to make change when change needs to happen. But all of that is happening in a sociocultural context where we are told stories about emotions. We're told things like, boys don't cry. Faith means that you're not trusting God, or fear means that you're not trusting God. And anger doesn't look good on a woman. And so we learn to shut these things down to belong. But in the process of shutting down the things that don't work for our community, we shut down all the other things too. And we cannot feel joy and experience joy if we haven't also given ourselves permission to feel our anger. But what happens is that when we're around someone who is feeling something, if we don't know how to be with our emotions, it can make us sufficiently uncomfortable that we want to make them and what they're feeling go away just so that we can manage what's going on for us. But emotions aren't just for us. They actually help us care for and protect our community. That's called empathy. We're just learning now that the neurobiological basis of empathy might be something called mirror neurons. And it's a special type of neuron in my body that helps me feel what's happening for you in your body. That means that if I'm connected to you, if I identify with you, if you matter or we're even in close proximity and you're feeling excitement, I can feel excitement. But if you're feeling hurt, I can feel your hurt with you. But we can't feel and accompany someone in their feelings, in their pain, in their joy, if we haven't given ourselves permission to feel within our own bodies. Now, this is where the justice piece comes in. Most of the isms that we face are about the body. Just run through the list of isms in your mind. Racism, ableism, heterosexism, sexism. You'll find that most of the isms that we're noticing in our culture at this time are about which bodies are socially valuable and which are not. But the problem is, I can't be angry about how you're being treated. I can't feel anger. It's me noticing that I can feel emotion in my body that allows me to do empathy with you. It's doing empathy that allows me to notice that you're hurting and to respond especially about how you, because of your body, are experiencing marginalization or oppression. And it's the emotion I feel in response to what you're going through that mobilizes me into action. It is our emotion in our body that gives us everything we need to make change. But I can't feel in my body what's happening in your body and care about it if I believe that bodies are bad. When we believe that the spirit is in the body instead of somewhere far away, we can connect to our goodness, we can connect to each other, and we can start to connect to the value of bodies that our community, that our culture, that our political systems have devalued and tried to make disappear. It's because I had an experience of goodness in my body that I want that for all of us. I want for you to have that experience of goodness in your body so that together we can start to deconstruct the narratives about bodies that are toxic and oppressive and are simply untrue. So let's end with where we started. Breath, spirit, 
in our lungs. Each of us, our heroes and our enemies, all of us breathing. If you ever forget that, the goodness of your own body or the goodness of someone else's bodies or why it's important to advocate that all bodies feel safe, I just invite you to take a look around at anyone who's breathing. Each of us with breath in our lungs. Each of us as mysterious and beautiful as the oceans and the mountains. Each of us made of inhales and exhales, constantly saying the name of God.